Through the fictional story, The Tartarus of Maids, Herman Melville paints a dreary picture of women's and child labor. His poignant satirical descriptions of workers in a remote paper factory clearly emboss the abominable working conditions of such professions. Pausing, she turned upon me a face pale with work and blue with cold, an eye supernatural with unrelated misery. During the early 19th century, the processes used in manufacturing seldom took into account the implications to workers' well-being and health. Often, as in Melville's narrative, irreparable damage would be done to children's health that would affect them for the rest of their lives. In the following passage, Melville chronicles the rag room of a paper factory. It was a great light room, furnished with no visible thing but rude, manger-like receptacles running all around its sides. And up to these mangers, like so many mares haltered to the rack, stood rows of girls. For each was vertically thrust up a long, glittering side, immovably fixed at bottom to the manger edge. The curve of this side, and having no snath to it, made it look exactly like a sword. To and fro, across the sharp edge, the girls forever dragged long strips of rags, washed white, picked from baskets at one side, thus ripping asunder every seam and converting the tatters almost into lint. The air swarmed with fine, poisonous particles, from which all sides darted suddenly as motes in sunbeams into the lungs. This is the rag room, coughed the boy. You find it rather stifling here, coughed I in answer, but the girls don't cough. Oh, they're used to it. Yes, murmured I to myself. I see it now. Turned outward, and each erected sword is so borne, edge outward before each girl. If my reading fails me not, just so, of old, condemned state prisoners went from the Hall of Judgment to their doom. An officer before bearing a sword, its edge turned outward in significance of their fatal sentence. So through consumptive pallors of this blank, raggy life go these pale girls to death their executioners themselves, wetting the very swords that slay them. Unsafe and horrid working conditions such as these were thrust upon workers regardless of sex or age. Factory owners sought to end the need for skilled labor in their factories. Automation and machine-like actions were expected of the workers. At rows of blank-looking counters sat rows of blank-looking girls with blank, white folders in their blank hands, all blankly folding blank paper. Even the workers' humanity was being stripped away by the continuous pressure to become more efficient and precise. Humans were not only the slaves of wages, but now the slaves of machines. Not a syllable was breathed. Nothing was heard but the low, steady, overruling hum of the iron animals. The human voice was banished from the spot. Machinery, that vaunted slave of humanity, here stood, menially served by human beings who served mutely and cringingly as the slave serves the sultan. The girls did not so much seem accessory wheels to the general machinery as mere cogs to the wheels. This purging of the need for skilled labor lessened the demand for older male workers and placed women and child laborers at the forefront of the labor pool. Most owners cared not for the conditions or plight of the workers. In fact, worker exploitation ran rampant. Outrageous working hours, unsafe working conditions, and exploitation of women and child's labor occurred because of the capitalist's need to eliminate excess costs for the factories and increase production. Latent sexist and age-dependent employment was especially obvious in such places as southern textile factories. Melville brings to the forefront this issue when he portrays the following scene between a factory owner and the protagonist of his story. Most of our girls come from far-off villages. The girls, echoed I glancing around their silent forms. Why is it, sir, that in most factories, female operatives of whatever age are indiscriminately called girls, never women? Oh, as to that, why, I suppose the fact of their being generally unmarried. That's the reason I should think. But it never struck me before. For our factory here, we will not have married women. They are apt to be off and on too much. We want none but steady workers. Twelve hours to the day, day after day, through the 365 days, excepting Sundays, Thanksgiving, and fast days. That's our rule. And so, having no married women, what females we have are rightly enough called girls. Attitudes such as these place enormous burdens on women and child laborers, slaving away in an increasingly demanding workplace. 
Sadly, it would take nearly a century for an up to stain of such exploitation to be challenged with serious legislation and changes in employer practices.